I believe you need to know this. This is not the message that I had planned. And uh, when those things happen, when God gives clear evidence of what he desires, I believe those are things that need to be shared. This Tuesday, as I was coming into work, I was suddenly just overwhelmed with the sense that I was not supposed to preach on what I had initially intended to do on Father's Day. When Pastor Kevin and I met on Tuesday morning, talked about that, we prayed together, and both of us had the sense, yeah, this, this is what we're supposed to do, and we're supposed to throw out the original playbook and go with what the Lord had been prompting us to do. This morning at 6.20 a.m., I received an email from a friend of mine who had no idea what this morning's message was going to be on. But my friend simply said, last night, God gave me the following words, and I'm passing them on to you and to Pastor Kevin. And the words are Acts chapter 3, verses 17 to 26. Those were the very words that Kevin and I, after praying, had said, that's the basis for the message today, because God is prompting that we talk about his love for the Jewish people, and how do we, as followers of Jesus, speak to our Jewish friends? And so this morning, that's where we're going to go. And at 6.25 this morning, it was so neat to email my friend and say, you won't believe this, but that's what this morning's message is on, those very words that God gave you overnight. So with that in mind, let's come before the Lord our God and let's approach him in prayer, asking that his Holy Spirit would guide and direct us as we receive his word and apply that word to our lives. Acts chapter 3 is the account of Peter and John, sometime after Pentecost, being moved by the Holy Spirit to tell a man who had been lame from birth to stand up and walk. They said, we don't have any silver or gold, but what we have we give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And it says at that moment, they held out, Peter held out his hand to the man. The man's ankles were strengthened. He rose to his feet. He began jumping and leaping and praising God, went running in through the beautiful gate into the temple courtyard, singing and praising God. People gathered around. They all listened and wondered what has happened. They recognized this is a man we have seen for years, and suddenly he is walking, and Peter speaks to them and says... Don't think that it's because of our piety that this man stands before you able to walk. This was done in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God rose, raised from the dead. That is the one we proclaim this morning, and it's that word we're going to examine together. Let's pray, shall we? Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you for the way you guide and direct your people throughout the ages. We thank you that you are God. You did not stop being God 2,000 years ago. You did not cease your Godhood when the Bible was completed. You continue to speak to your children today. You continue to move by the power of your Holy Spirit. You break through into people's lives. You call us out of darkness into your light. You summon us to your very presence where you bless us and give us healing and hope and forgiveness and life. Lord, we thank you for your incredible heart. And we thank you for your desire that all people be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. We thank you that you are calling your children around the world to an ever deeper relationship with you in these last days so that the nations may know you, so that people who today are estranged from you may be brought back to you through the sovereign power of our Lord Jesus Christ and through the working of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. We pray this morning, Lord, that you would speak to each of our hearts, that you would minister minister to our very souls by your word of truth that you would give us direction, healing, strength, provision, and power so that the name of Jesus may be honored, so that your lost children may be reclaimed, and so that everything may be ready for that day when the Lord Jesus returns, that we may all say, Hosanna, praise the name of the Lord, praise the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Listen now to these words, Acts chapter 3. Shortly after Peter and John had spoken to the man who had been lame from birth over 40 years, unable to walk, 
shortly after he was healed and crowds gathered in the uh, temple ground area and kind of moved over towards Solomon's portico where Peter and John were able to speak to those crowds of fellow Israelites. This is what they said. Acts chapter 3, beginning at verse 17. The words of the apostle Peter. Now, fellow Israelites... I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up from you, for you rather, a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel and all the prophets who have spoken, have, they have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. And with those words... Peter spoke to his fellow countrymen and women, calling them to the very one whom God had promised all along. And it raises for us a very obvious question in this day and age. With the rising anti-Semitism all around the world, with the nation of Israel once again restored to the land that God promised to Abraham and his descendants forever, with for the first time in 2,000 years, most of the, Jew, uh, the majority of the Jewish people living in the land. What does this mean? And how do we as followers of Jesus relate to our Jewish friends? What do we say to them? What should I say to a Jewish friend? You know, as I've pondered those, those thoughts this past week, And as they first came to mind in the car on Tuesday, in just an overwhelming sense, there are several things that have stood out, and remarkably, they're right here in Peter's words as well. Peter did not look at his fellow fellow countrymen and say, you lousy people, you crucified the Messiah, now you're in trouble. He said, fellow Israelites... Because you see, we all put the Messiah on the cross. It was our sin that put him there. The sin of each and every one of us, it was my sin that brought him to Calvary. Peter does not say, you are lost forever. He says, fellow Israelites, listen to these words, what God has promised all along. What should I say to my Jewish friend? I think one of the first things I should say is, I thank God for you. I thank God for you because I have been grafted in. If it were not for the Jewish people, Jesus summed it up very clearly. John chapter 4, he said, salvation is from the Jews. If it were not for the Jewish people, I would still be worshiping carved rocks and demonic spirits. Because it was only through God's intervention in the life of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob, only through God's intervention through the great Hebrew prophets, only through God's working through kings and apostles that I have come to know as a Gentile, the God of the universe and the one who loves his children and has appointed one group of people to be the means through which Messiah would come and the means by which all the nations would come to know God. And so when I ask myself the question, what should I say to my Jewish friend? The first thing that comes to mind is gratitude. I thank God for you. I thank God that he has chosen one group of people to be the means through which he draws all people to himself. I thank God for the blessings that he has given 
through the people of Israel. Because, as the Apostle, puts it, Apostle Paul puts it, from them trace the prophets and temple worship. Through them come the patriarchs. And through them, Romans chapter 9, verse 5, is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Of what value is there in being a Jew, the Bible says, much value. Romans, the Apostle Paul, chapter 2. And so, when I speak to my Jewish friend, one of the first things I desire to say is I thank God for you. But as I look at the Scriptures, and as I look at history, there's something else that immediately comes to mind. And what I would want to say is, I am so deeply sorry. I am so deeply sorry for what many who have borne the name of Jesus have done to the Jewish people over the centuries. Even a cursory glance at the history of the Christian church shows how endemic the persecution of Jewish people has been among those who hold the name of Jesus dear. And lest we say to ourselves, oh, well, that was just a few long ago, or that was, that was a different group, that's not our group. Folks, we come from the same roots, and we need to understand that. And we need to recognize that there are many Jewish people who have never even listened to the claims of Jesus because of what people who claim to follow Jesus have said and done to them. I am terribly sorry, deeply sorry. Unless you say, well, those are people unrelated and, you know, that, that's from a different tribe and group and time. That's the Inquisition. That's not us. May I read to you this morning some words written by a noted Christian author that caused me just to become sick to my stomach. Listen to these words, and I quote, I shall give you my sincere advice. First, to set fire to their synagogues. Second, I advise that their houses also be razed and destroyed. Third, I advise that all their prayer books be taken from them. Fourth, I advise that their rabbis be forbidden to teach henceforth on pain of loss of life and limb. Fifth, I advise that safe conduct on the highways be abolished completely for the Jews. Sixth, I advise that money lending be prohibited to them and that all cash and treasure of silver and gold be taken from them and put aside for safekeeping, end quote. The Christian author who wrote that, Martin Luther, 1543. Lest any of us say, well, it's a different tribe and it's not us, I rest my case I am deeply sorry. Like Daniel of old, who looked at what his own people had done, and although he had not been part of it, he realized there is such a thing as collective guilt. We have all sinned, O oh Lord, and we humble ourselves before you. I believe that the Christian church has a great deal of repenting that needs to take place, and that starts with me. You see, we cannot simply say, well, that's others. Them is us. And so, we come before God and say, Lord, have mercy on us. And we come before our friends and neighbors and say, I am deeply sorry. I am cut to the heart. It's not a comfortable word, is it? It's a painful word. But it is nonetheless true. And it's only when we face the truth that can, we can truly live in the truth. It is only as we come before God with humility and with broken hearts 
that our hearts can be healed and restored and the damage that has been done through the ages can be set aside and a new way be brought forth. In these last days, I believe God is calling all people to himself. I recognize that what is going on in the world today is absolutely unprecedented in terms of the movement of God's Holy Spirit in places we never thought possible. And today, as we look at a world that seems to be spiraling downward in hatred, it is so important that God's people stand up and truly humble ourselves and speak His truth to others. And so to my Jewish friend, I say, I thank God for you. I also say, I am deeply sorry. And I say something else. Have you heard the story? Have you heard the story? Because you see, because of what people who have borne the name of Jesus have often said and done, there are many who have never really heard the incredible story of God stepping into human history in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And when we hear that story, it's life-changing. For my Jewish friend, one of the first things that I'd want to say with that is, you realize, Jesus was Jewish. He is Jewish. And he will always be Jewish. This is your story. I've been brought in as a Johnny-come-lately, but this is your story. This is the story of your people. This is the story of a God who first spoke to Abraham and who now has fulfilled the promises he gave through Moses. This is the story of a God who spoke through his prophets and said, look at what is to come. This is the story of a God who keeps his word literally. I think of an account that I just read this past week of a rabbi who was reading the book of Zechariah in the Hebrew Scriptures. And as he read that book, he just found himself overwhelmed by what he was taking in. That the day would come when one would come on a donkey, on the colt of a donkey, and would come into the city of Jerusalem and would be received with shouts of praise, Hosanna to the King. And he read those words and he found such incredible courage comfort and strength in them. He was still a young man. He went to talk to his rabbi about those words. And the rabbi said, well, those are symbolic words. They, 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 uh, they just speak of an ideal time yet to come. And then this young man, who had become a rabbi, picked up a copy, a Hebrew translation of the New Testament, he began reading the account of Jesus entering the city of Jerusalem on the day known as Palm Sunday, when he came on a colt, on a donkey's colt, and crowds received him with shouts of thanksgiving and praise, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he read the words of Matthew, or Levi, as he was also known, who talked about the genealogy of Jesus the son of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. He said, those are my people. And there is the literal fulfillment of what I've been reading about since I was a little boy. He is the promised one. He is the Messiah. And his life was changed. And today, he is a rabbi in Israel at a messianic synagogue proclaiming to Jewish people that God has kept his word even as he promised through his servants, the prophets. And he speaks the real story of Jesus, that God intervened in human history, that in a remarkable way, a young Jewish woman became pregnant without a human father. She bore one whom the angel said would be the son of the living God. He lived among us. He lived a perfect life, totally obedient to the Torah. One who faithfully followed all of the words of the Heavenly Father. And one who evidenced a relationship with the living God unlike anything anyone had seen before. In the Hebrew Scriptures, we read about God as Father 13 times in all, as we mentioned just a few weeks ago. 
But in Jesus, we hear him speaking about the Father all the time. My Father is still working, he said. What my Father does, I do. I only say what my Father is saying. I only do what the Father tells me to do. Jesus taught his followers to pray not to a God who is distant, but to a God who is near. And to pray like this, Our Father, our Father in heaven, may your name be holy, holy among us. May your kingdom come now in our hearts and in our lives and in this world. May your will be done on earth as in heaven. He spoke like no one had ever spoken before. When many of the religious leaders sent soldiers to arrest him, they said, bring this guy in. He's a danger to the nation. The soldiers came back empty-handed. And when they were questioned, why didn't you do something? They said, no one ever spoke like this man speaks. Because they were hearing the very words of God. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. He says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. And I have many other sheep outside of this sheepfold. And they too will be brought in. That's the story. The story of a God who stepped into our world. The story of a God who actually became a human being in a way that we cannot fully comprehend. But the story of one who healed the sick who dealt with those who were down and out, who did not turn his head away from those that the rest of the world ignored, but instead waded in amidst them, who laid his hands on lepers and healed them, who placed his hands upon blind eyes so that they could see, who spoke with power and authority, who cut through the religious fog and the self-sanctity of people who were more into themselves than they were into God. And one who boldly stepped in and said, you need to repent and turn back to the living God. He is good. He is the faithful Father. And he was the one then who willingly allowed himself to be arrested by Gentiles, defamed by fellow Israelites, beaten by both of us, spit upon by all of us, struck and brutalized and nailed to a cross. He is the one who allowed himself to endure the agony of a damned individual because God so loved the world that he stepped in. And in the person of Jesus, he called all Israel back to himself and called all Israel to bring that to the nations. That's the story. The story of one who endured that for us all, who willingly took on himself the punishment for our rebellion, for Israel's rebellion, who died, and who on the third day, on the feast of first fruits, rose from the grave and announced that he had fulfilled everything that the scriptures had spoken. And so as I speak to my dear Jewish friend, I would also say, the prophets point to him as well. The prophets point to him. The great Hebrew prophets who wrote hundreds, even thousands of years ago, all of them spoke of him. 3,500 years ago, Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18 said, God will raise up among you a prophet like me. Whoever does not listen to him will be cut off from all the people. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 21, the scripture says, Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. God allowed the Messiah. God actually went to the tree in the person of Messiah, to be a curse for us. And that is what the prophets spoke of. But the prophets also said, God will not allow His Holy One to see corruption. 
What David said in the Psalms was literally fulfilled when the Holy One, the Messiah, the Anointed One rose from the grave because God always keeps His Word and He will not allow His Holy One to rot in the grave. He will raise Him up and He did raise Him up and He is alive and He's coming back. And on the day that he returns, all people will behold him. And we will shout aloud, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Because the prophets have always pointed to him. And they still do. I would say to my Jewish friend, as you read the Hebrew scriptures, you know what happens when God's people ignore what God has said. There comes judgment. Painful judgment. And we see that very clearly in the Old Testament scriptures. Israel turned away from the living God to worship the Baals and the Asherah poles and the false gods of the people around them. And God repeatedly sent prophets to them to call them back, but by and large they did not hear or heed. And in the end, he sent them into exile for 70 years. A 70-year exile that the rabbis looked upon and said, we got what we deserved. God brought them back. But then, 500 years later, they were sent into exile again. And that exile lasted for 1,900 years. And today, many devout students of the Hebrew Scriptures and many devout rabbis ask the question, what could we have possibly done that was so bad that God would have sent us into exile for 19 centuries if the worship of the Baals and bowing down at the Asherah poles brought only 70 years of exile? What horrible crime could have brought about 1,900 years? And there is only one possible explanation other than coincidence. As we've mentioned, that word does not appear in the Scriptures. The only thing you can use to explain it is what the prophet Daniel wrote 2,500 years ago. Listen to these words of Daniel from Daniel chapter 9. They come out of one of the most difficult chapters in all of the Old Testament one that has been widely and variously interpreted, but one that does speak very clearly about one particular thing. This is what Daniel says. Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. He says, The Messiah will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. 2,500 years ago, Daniel predicted that the Messiah would be killed and that after his death, the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed and so would the temple. And that is precisely what happened one generation after Jesus' death and resurrection. No matter how you may interpret human history, you cannot ignore those words of the prophet that clearly point to the fact that Messiah would be executed that the temple would be destroyed and the city of Jerusalem trodden down. Jesus said the same thing. Luke chapter 21, our Lord Jesus said, Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And in the lifetime of many of us, we saw those very words fulfilled in a remarkable way when for the first time in almost 1,900 years, the Jewish people returned to the city of Jerusalem. We're living in those days, folks. And they point to something else that the prophets have said. Because you see, the prophets say that God pours out His grace on all people, Jewish people and Gentile people. And that in the end, He desires that all of them be saved. As a Gentile, I know that I am here purely by the grace of God. 
I was grafted in. I did not deserve this. I don't earn it. It's not something I worked for. It is not something I sought. It is something God did, and I praise him for that. But God also says he has not forgotten his chosen people. And that his desire, after the full number of Gentiles come in, after those who are grafted in contrary to nature have been brought into the congregation of God's people, then his chosen people will also return. And when they do, the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans, if their rejection of the Lord Jesus meant that the Gentiles come to faith, what will their acceptance mean except Life from the dead. That's what he says. In other words, as the Jewish people come back to the living God, so also Jesus will return from heaven. It's the very thing that the Apostle Peter spoke here in Acts chapter 3. He said, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. And then he goes on to say, Repent then and return to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through the holy prophets. I believe we are living in an amazing time. We are seeing God moving around the world. They are dangerous times. They are frightening times. But they are also times of incredible celebration and incredible joy because our God is doing the very thing He promised in His Word. He is restoring all things. He's calling His people back to Him. He's bringing new life among followers of Jesus. He's bringing followers of Jesus out of the most unlikely places where we have seen in the last 20 years more Muslims coming to faith in the Lord Jesus than we saw in the previous 14 centuries. God is breaking into the world. Since Jerusalem once again was no longer trodden down by the Gentiles but was under Jewish control, we have seen God moving mightily among the Jewish people, calling them back to Messiah. In 1967, when Jerusalem was still a divided city, about 2,000 people, Jewish people in all the world, believed in Jesus as Messiah. 2,000. Today, even Israeli newspapers are saying the number is now approaching half a million. From 2,000 to half a million in basically 50 years. God is moving and it means that we need to allow him to have full reign in our hearts because you see, our faith is not simply a heavenly insurance policy that we get to cash in after we die. Our faith is a living thing. Our God is a living God who is still active, still at work in the world, who still is calling all people to himself, who is moving the hearts and minds of people by the work of his Holy Spirit to follow where he leads, to go where he calls us to go, and to do what he tells us to do, and that is to proclaim the good news that Jesus is the Messiah, and that in him there is hope and healing and forgiveness and life. That is what the apostle Peter spoke about in Acts chapter 3, and that is what the people of God proclaim today, because God is good, and he is the heavenly Father, and he is God. And that, my dear friends, is radical. Because if God is God, then it means that he has full control over the lives of his children, and he desires that. So we yield our hearts to him, and I invite you to do that right now. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Oh Lord, our God, we stand in awe of you. We humble ourselves before you because we have so often messed up in our lives, Lord. Lord, have mercy upon your church for the ways that we have so often persecuted the very children whom you chose to be the means by which the nations would come to know you. Forgive us, O Lord, for our sins against the Jewish people, for our mistreatment, our misspeaking, our our ungodly attitudes. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. And oh, God, pour out upon them 
every good gift even as you desire. In these last days, Lord, we pray that you would bring a multitude of Jewish people to Jesus, their Messiah, the one who fulfills the promises given to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We pray, Lord, that you would build in our hearts a deep love for the Jewish people, that we might bless them and bless Israel and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray also, Lord, for those who are persecuting and hating them. We pray that you would move in power throughout the world to draw all people to your love, that we may worship you and may live a life of love even as Jesus has taught us. We pray for the Islamic world, Lord. We pray that you would bring mullahs to a knowledge of Jesus the Messiah. We thank you for the way you are changing hearts, the people who were formerly angry and harbored hatred against the Jewish people are suddenly realizing these are the ones God has chosen through whom the prophets came and the Messiah came. And we pray, Lord, that you would build a new community. As the Apostle Paul says, that you would make one new man Jew and Gentile, who acknowledge you as creator of the universe, who bow before the Lord Jesus as the Messiah of Israel and the hope of the nations. We say, Lord, take control of our lives. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that Jesus may be honored, that your work may be carried out, and that we may live to see the day when all people look heavenward and say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Amen and amen. Let's praise and glorify the name of Jesus our Savior in song.